basically, we're going to work backwards. In order to figure out like how to win a round effectively in under basically any type of panel, right? we need to first establish what a final focus needs to look like, the type of final focus that will win any panel. Then we work backwards to figure out what a summary looks like, then a rebuttal, and finally a case that is most conducive to that incredibly effective final focus speech. So, what are the goals in like a back half speech, in like a summary or a final focus in order for you to cleanly win the ballot? So the first goal you have is that you want to limit your opponent's weighable offense. This doesn't just mean that you need to win or respond to all of their arguments. This means that you need to reduce the weighability of those arguments. This means that in a good round, which you guys will all be having here, you're not going to be uh, able to win every single argument in the round. They're going to be winning something, right? Which means that at that point, your best line of defense is to make whatever they go for Force them to first go for arguments that aren't as strong, and second, force them to not be able to weigh those arguments, either by diluting the probability, the impact, or the clarity of their argument. That way you're going to be able to make their argument unweighable compared to any offense that you go for. The second thing you need to do is to frontline key responses effectively. They're going to put responses in your case. You need to choose the ones that are important and respond to them swiftly and effectively, obviously if you want to have any offense, and it's a prerequisite to your next goal, which is creating avenues to the ballot. So this is important. When you go for offense, right, on your case and on their case in the form of turns or advantages, you need to be able to frame those arguments as a path to the ballot, as a reason the judge should vote for you. So this means that when you go for offense in your case, your impact must be sufficiently large and your link must be sufficiently strong that it is enough for you to win even if your opponent is winning whatever arguments they go for. This also means that when you go for a turn or a response that is offensive to their case, right? Everyone knows what that is. You need to frame and weigh that turn in a way that will get you direct access to the ballot, that will win you the round. The problem with too many debaters is they go for too many arguments and they do not make these arguments, they don't terminalize them to the ballot. So a turn could be extended on someone's contention one, they don't go for that argument, they go for their contention two. If their contention two's impact is big enough, then it will outweigh your turn, which means your turn was basically useless and sucked time away from what you really should have been doing, which is answering that contention two. Not every turn is worth reading and not every turn is worth going for. Only arguments that will end up in the RFD are sufficient to go for aside from defense, of course, which again, limits their way ability. Last two goals are defending the narrative. So, in extremely tight rounds, whichever team provides a better explanation for everything that's happening, both on their side and your side, is a team that's going to win. A better explanation means that you need to be able to explain a logical story for your argument, right? Why A causes B. Not just because you have a card that says A causes B and a card that says B causes C, but why it happens. And you should be able to explain the entire link chain as basically one like clear like storyline. Like even if you can explain individual parts of your link chain, like you, you can explain why it's even to win close is key for legitimacy. Or you can explain why legitimacy causes us to stop conflict. You need to explain why the type of legitimacy that exceeding to win close creates is the type of legitimacy that stops conflict, which requires you to have a one sentence explanation for the entire link chain rather than two one sentence explanations for each part that are kind of disjointed. All right. So defending that narrative is important because when you have a comprehensive account of how your argument works, and more so a comprehensive account of what is happening in the world today, what will happen when you go pro, not just for your arguments, but in general, that narrative will help you deal with the offense that your opponents go for. It will help you kind of explain why their offense is either less credible or why the cause of the problems that they identify is different than the cause that they give you, and why the solution to the problems that they identify is better accomplished through your ballot than through theirs. And I'll get more into specifics in a second. Last and final goal is weigh and implicate, i.e. write the RFD for the judge. So in addition to going for arguments that create paths to the ballot, make it explicit that they are in fact paths to the ballot. This means directly comparing your warrants to your opponent's warrants and explaining why your warrants are stronger and directly comparing your impacts to your opponent's impacts and explaining why your impacts are stronger, not just why your impacts are big or why your impacts outweigh in a vacuum, but why they specifically outweigh their argument, meaning in the context of their impact, we need to explain why yours is bigger. Now that we've got like, the goals, we'll get into the specifics. First thing I want to talk about is uh, basically how narrative debate works. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, fair enough. So far, I just went through the goals for like an effective back half strategy. Now we're going to talk about narrative debate and basically how that works. So you guys haven't missed too much yet.
Whatever you guys are already over to. Okay, cool. So, so talking about narrative debate, right? So obviously, what is a narrative? Not only is it like a, again, this logical explanation for how your case happens that you can tell anybody without referencing a card, it's something a lot bigger than that. So a narrative really means that you have a worldview. A worldview is basically your account of how the world works in general, not just how the world works pertinent to this topic. So what does that mean? For example, the type, the type of person who is likely, like let's say the topic is we should have a universal healthcare system, right? Somebody writes an article for an app. When you're on the app, you want to be in the position as the type of person who would write an article for the app. What's the type of person that would write an article for the app? That type of person is likely to be liberal in terms of government involvement in general. That person probably believes that the capitalist free market is insufficient to serve people's basic needs. They probably believe that government programs in general are effective, and they probably believe that a prerequisite to having sustainable economic growth is providing people basic human rights like healthcare, housing, and education. These are things that they believe outside the scope of healthcare, and healthcare is just one part of that. So on this topic, what does that mean? On the net, right, you probably think that UNCLOS does not work, right, countries won't follow it, you think countries like China are self-interested and aggressive, you think that it will weaken our Navy or things like that, and you think that weakening the US Navy and our military is bad. But what does a type of person who would write a neg article believe? Well, this is the type of person who generally does not like international agreements. And why do they not like international agreements generally? Well, that's because they adhere to the school of thought in international relations that is referred to as realism. In international relations, there are two big schools of thought. There's realism and there's liberalism. And there's like a big debate about which one is better. Realism is the idea that first, all countries are self-interested. They are exclusively self-interested. This means that things like international rulings and law are not sufficient to get countries to change their behavior because so long as complying with the law does not make it in their self-interest, they will break the law. So China would break UNCLOS because it's still in their self-interest to acquire power. These people also generally believe that Multilateral arrangements in general are ineffective, therefore, because you can't enforce international law using soft power. You need hard power. Then their third conclusion. They believe that the only way to get countries to change their behavior is to make it in their best interest. This means the application of hard power, things like military pressure, so they know that if they keep being bad, it will actually be worse for them because of things like backlash, but it also means things like economic and diplomatic pressure, so you can still use soft power, but it needs to fundamentally have a type of leverage involved where you're telling these countries that if you don't follow what we say, you will face consequences that are greater than the benefit of you continuing to do what you do. Finally, countries who are realists believe, one sec, Countries who are realists believe that international relations are fundamentally zero sum. This means that when one person is strengthened, the enemy is weakened, and vice versa. This means that if a country's navy becomes weaker, their enemy's navy or their enemy's aggression will increase because they will see every sense of weakness as an opportunity to increase their self-interest because now they don't think the country's going to respond. By Congress strengthening the US, for example, through our navy, would weaken a country like China because the cost to war would increase, therefore their self-interest to be aggressive would decrease. Now, on the F, what is your worldview? Your worldview is that of liberalism, which is the worldview the U.S. has used ever since the creation of the League of Nations, basically after World War I and more so after World War II. So basically, liberalism is the belief that while countries might be self-interested, countries recognize that there are benefits to cooperation, specifically because of the existence of things called superordinate goals. They think that countries can figure out their common ground, things they can both benefit from, and they should work together on that common ground, because that is the only way to make real progress. Right? So therefore, they value things like international law and cooperation because even though they don't create consequences, they create a common framework by which we can approach these superordinate goals, and then by approaching these superordinate goals, we make real progress. They also, therefore, fundamentally think that international relations are not zero-sum. This means that A, they probably are not as big of a fan of unilateral hard power, like increasing our military through the US alone, because they think that that actually backfires and causes other countries to become correspondingly aggressive. So for example, in the Cold War, a big liberalist theory was proven to be true, because us increasing our aggression did not cause Russia to stop increasing their aggression, it just created an arms race where we were both increasing our aggression at the same time, which was a lose-lose situation because both sides were seeing an experienced increased risk of conflict. 
By contrast, they say that not everything has to be a win-lose either, because you can have win-win situations where two countries can collaborate, they can both put something in, and they can both get something greater out. For example, if everybody worked together to stop climate change, many countries would benefit from that. It wouldn't have to be that countries have to give something up and other countries benefit, for example. Right? So. Liberalists would like unclose because it would facilitate cooperation, which would then get countries together to work on things like economic sanctions, like enforcing legal obligations, like increasing the U.S.'s credibility in negotiations to prevent changes to unclose, all kinds of things that can be accomplished by multilateralism, and they think that this current approach of hard power, unilateral militarism is obviously a bad approach because it's just going to make China mad. So, why is the worldview incredibly important? It's because sometimes you're going to hit arguments that you're not prepared for. Right? You're going to hit evidence that's really specific about what's happening right now. And when you're in that situation, not being prepared for that specific argument is okay if you have a worldview about how things in general happen. Right? And the reason is because you can use the general principles of that worldview to engage these arguments. So let me give you an example because it's a lot easier explained that way. Let's say you're on the next. This means you're in the position of realism. And you get an app argument which says that uh, right now nine countries are choosing to not follow UNCLOS because they are following China instead. And this is bad because it leads to more aggression. And if we exceed to UNCLOS, these nine countries will instead follow the US because the US will have like more soft power, which will then prevent these countries from being aggressive. And their card is very explicit about what these nine countries are doing, and it's very explicit that aggression is going up right now. Right? So you might say, crap, I need to find an index to this card. But if you're a realist, it's super easy for you to respond to this. First, the fundamental. Okay. Yeah, you are you this a little bit, but just pop in. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, I, just to kind of segue off of where I just was, we we're talking about how narrative debate requires a broader worldview, where you basically have like a logical uh, kind of frame of thinking for the round that's more so more general than the resolution. So for example, like on this topic, it's a question of realism versus liberalism. Are you a person that believes that countries are always self-interested and that you need to use consequences to stop them? Or are you a person who thinks that countries should cooperate to solve shared goals and that hard power or like aggression is gonna backfire and increase their aggression? So I was explaining how you can use these worldviews of this narrative to answer arguments that you're not prepared for. So again, if somebody says countries are bowing out of UNCLOS right now, they have really specific evidence about what these countries are doing, and then they're saying that if we exceed to UNCLOS, they'll stop bowing out of UNCLOS, right? You don't have evidence to respond to this. But if you are on the neg, you're taking the position of realism, which means that your narrative is that countries are self-interested, even if your case is only about China. This is really important, because first, they're making an assumption. They're making an assumption that the reason that these countries are being aggressive is because they are following China. You get to break down that assumption with your narrative, which I'll explain in a second. And second, they're making an assumption that the solution to this problem is US accession and US credibility, but we are going to break down that solution and say that the solution does not work and that there is a better solution achieved through realism. So let's say I get to this argument and I don't have a response. It's very simple. I say this. I say, they tell you that these countries are bowing out of UNCLOS right now because America is not involved. What we tell you in our case is that the reason countries do this is because they are self-interested. If a country is going to bow out of UNCLOS, that's because it's fundamentally in their self-interest to be aggressive. This is very important because voting for the affirmative does not change the fact that it is still in their self-interest to be aggressive. These countries will break the rules no matter what. That's really critical because voting for them is a big turn. If you vote for them, you're taking a soft approach on these countries and you're appeasing them and showing them that America is not going to be strong, which is only going to intensify their self-interest and aggression. When you vote for the NEG, you are voting for US hard power and increasing the strength of our Navy, which is the only way to deter these countries from acting on their words and taking the islands that they're trying to take right now. So in doing so, I basically substituted their argument using principles of realism, and I was able to show that the cause is more consistent with realism, and the solution is more consistent with realism. I am controlling the narrative on their argument, therefore making it my argument. Is everyone clear until now? Yeah. All right. So the worldview is incredibly important, and I basically explained to you what the two worldviews are on this topic. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is part of the narrative debate are um, yeah, yeah. So your 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 key job when you're hitting arguments that you're not prepared for, or cards, for example. Yeah, hey just pick up. Uh, don't have to pick up on what you know so far. All right. So, right. When you have this worldview, when you have like this set of ideas, and whoever's here can cast them up later. 
right? Um, you basically want to use it to do two things. First, you want to cast doubt on the causality they're providing you and provide alternative causes. This is one way to use your worldview to answer arguments. And second, you want to analytically explain why their solution is ineffective. So uh, again, like, I'm trying to think of another example. Like, oh yeah, yeah, like on the NAPS topic, and our NEG case was basically talking about how NAFTA, which is the free trade agreement between Mexico, the US, and Canada, is basically bad for Mexico's economy because it destroys their economy and all these things, right? And our narrative was specifically that N Mexico was already gradually opening themselves up to trade before NAFTA. What NAFTA did is it did, made it happen all at once instead of being gradual. So Mexico didn't have some like didn't have the time to adapt and kind of like prepare themselves. So they were thoroughly outcompeted by the United States. So poverty increased in Mexico, right? So this narrative, while we're talking about Mexico specifically, is based on the worldview which is anti-neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is the worldview that trade must happen all at once, it must be deregulated, and it must happen, uh, again, without any government intervention in order for countries to truly succeed. Whereas anti-neoliberalism, advanced by like uh, economists like Joseph Stiglitz, is the idea that while trade is probably good, um, we cannot have it with uh, while trade is probably good, we cannot have it with like uh, happening all at once, and it cannot happen without government intervention. Because if it does, then basically it's unequal players will mean that like large countries will squash out smaller ones. So using this narrative, right? If someone reads a card that says that foreign investment increased by 50% as a result of NAFTA, and then they say that foreign investment is good, right? Like I don't know how to respond to that on face, but I read a card in my case saying that generally Mexico is gradually liberalizing its economy even before NAFTA, and would have still been able to benefit from trade. So I would go up and I would say, right, they tell you that foreign investment increased by 50% because of NAFTA, but their fundamental assumption is that the only way to get investment is NAFTA. We tell you that countries were gradually liberalizing globally, which is why foreign investment went to everywhere, it would have happened either way. But the reason you turn this argument is because when it happened all at once and it happened without any government regulation, we would argue that that investment went into taking over Mexican land and pushing out Mexican businesses with Western multinationals instead of going into domestic Mexican businesses, building up a sustainable base that would employ more people, provide better jobs, and lower prices more, right? So it's the same argument, but I'm moving it to my side through my narrative. So uh, now that I've talked about the worldview, two more things. First, cross applications are insufficient. Saying that you have an argument that contradicts theirs in your case is not sufficient to invalidate their argument. It's simply telling the judge that there's some work to be done here, right? There are two irresolvable claims. Unless your cross application is directly taking their point into account, in 99.9% of cases it's not, you need to be doing extra analysis that does take their point into account and explains why your account of what's happening is better, truer, or more important than their account of what's happening. So for example, two teams in this last round ran naval interdiction, or PSI. One said that, uh, on the neg, said that uh, UNCLOS takes away the US's ability to seize and board ships without consent or without evidence, therefore reducing the efficacy of PSI. The other side said that UNCLOS would allow more countries to get involved in PSI, therefore making PSI more effective. Then in rebuttal, when responding to each other's argument, he said, cross apply our argument where we show you that PSI becomes less effective and here's why. And the other side said, cross apply our argument where we tell you that you're going to have more countries, which is more effective and here's why. That's not debate. That's literally just restating your argument but using the words cross apply before. People aren't actually doing the engagement of arguments. What they needed to be doing is explaining why the weakening of the United States, for example, is more important than the strengthening of everybody else. And an example could be that it is better to have one country that is actually capable of doing interdictions on our enemies, which are never going to consent to naval interdiction, than to have 200 countries that are capable of doing interdictions, but our enemies are fundamentally going to say no, which means there is no chance that the most important nuclear weapons actually get stuck. Or on the app, you can say that it's fundamentally more important to have more countries involved so that we have better intelligence. So even if the countries say no, we have evidence which allows us to board these ships, which means that on that we're getting more interdictions done than to have one country which, while capable of doing interdictions, certainly does not have the manpower to stop every nuclear weapons transfer around the globe. Right? Either of these comparative analyses would have won the round very clearly early in the rebuttal, but nobody was doing it, which forced me as the judge to intervene. And really, I only intervened or only voted on one side on the argument because the other side dropped it. Like if they didn't drop it, I would have literally no way to analyze this, analyze this argument. So cross applications are insufficient, extra analysis needed. Finally, uh, my recommendation is that when you're preparing your rebuttal in your case, in addition to framing your case around first, the biggest impact, like think backwards. Figure out what do you think is going to be the biggest impact in the round and write your case to get to that impact. Not only the biggest, but the most weighable impact. What is the prerequisite generally to most of the other impacts in the debate? And second, 
What is the strongest link into that impact? What is the best and most weighable way to access that impact? So if the impact is conflict, then think a, look, think a step back. What is the strongest predictor of conflict? Is it nuclear weapons or is it Chinese aggression? If you can, if you think you can explain why nuclear weapons are a strongest predictor of conflict, then work back from there. All right, what is the strongest link into nuclear weapons? Is it intelligence? Is it interdictions? Is it blah, blah, blah? And then write that as your warrant, right? So at every step, you're thinking of the strongest link. So you have the strongest paths from the resolution to the impact to the balance. In addition to that, I recommend that all of you have a core set of responses planned. So while you guys should be prepared and have blocks and stuff like that, I think it's more effective to have four to five key responses that you're using every single round, or even less, like two or three, that you're using every single round, applying it to the relevant arguments, and doing analysis to make them more relevant to the specifics of the arguments, than to have a really tight block file with five responses to every argument that don't really line up with each other or kind of advance a clear story. These two to five clear responses are preferable because A, they're multi-use. So like a general response on, our neg on the neg on the NAFTA topic was this card which said that basically without NAFTA, Mexico would have still enjoyed the majority of the benefits of trade because of like this whole gradual liberalization process. Then literally any argument that was predicated on the benefits of trade, right? Like for example, if they say that NAFTA increases the Mexico's ability to get energy from the US which lowered fuel prices in Mexico. I can go up and I can read this card and I can be like, this means that obviously if Mexico is increasing access to trade, they're going to be trading for energy as well, which means that fuel prices would have gone down either way. But the turn is that through NAFTA, and then again I do my analysis about why gradual liberalization is better, they became incredibly dependent on only America's energy market and didn't have their own, which then meant that they were more vulnerable to spikes in the prices of things like oil and more vulnerable to volatility in the U.S. economy, which is why every recession that the U.S. has had has hit Mexico especially hard. Things like that, right? So we were using the general response, but then using logic to apply it to more specifics in their case. And I think this is very good because the general response is going to be more consistent with your narrative. Every second you spend your rebuttal reading one of these responses is adding to your narrative. Every second you spend this rebuttal reading like, like very like, I guess blippy defense that's not related to anything else is the second you're wasting and subtracting from your narrative because you're shifting the judge's focus away from the thing that's actually going to be winning you the rap. Okay, now I'm going to talk about background strategy. So I've talked about how to frame your case, how to frame your rebuttal, and how to frame your impact analysis in the round, as well as answering arguments analytically using a narrative. Now I'm going to talk about how that breaks down in a late speech and how you structure this late speech to get the ballot every time. There are three parts to a back half speech. The first part is framing, the second part is their case, and the third part is your case. So let's talk about the first part, which is framing, and this happens chronologically in your speech. You basically want to start your summary or final focus with an overview. An overview is just kind of, how does this round break down for the judge? It helps frame the round in the judge's mind, not just in terms of the framework, as in like the impacts are most important are X or Y, but also what the judge should look to first when they evaluate this debate. Where is the first place my pen goes to circle things on my flow when I'm writing my RFD? This happens in one of three ways. The first way is impact framing. Simply tell me what is the most important impact and why. Right? You need an explanation of why that impact is the most important, but you also, and this is important, need to compare, use an analysis, and specifically single out their arguments that do not look into this impact and explain why your impact would be bigger than that specific thing. So for example, the most important impact in this round is stopping the transfer of nuclear weapons because so-and-so finds that nuclear weapons are a prerequisite to aggression. Countries feel more confident that they can lash out when they have a nuclear weapon as an insurance policy so no one will challenge them. Right? That's like decent wing analysis. Well, I'd be like, like, prefer this over arguments like Chinese aggression. And the reason that while they're impacting to one conflict, which no side is likely to resolve in the near future, we are impacting the prevention of dozens of conflicts in the future, which is A, more conflicts, but B, we have a higher likelihood of actually stopping them. What's up? You kind of missed half of it, but just keep going with me. So the, again, the first type is impact analysis, and it must be implicated to the specific arguments they have in the round, because otherwise, these debates get messy. Second type is um, uniqueness. So this is basically, if you guys are both trying to solve the same impact, right, then impact framing is less important, and what's more important is who's gonna get to that impact first. So this is where uniqueness comes into play. Uniqueness is basically explaining what is the situation on the ground. Like, what's happening right now, so I know where my vote should go, right? So like, for example, if it was like a presidential race, we have like one president who's saying like, let's like stick, stick to how things are now, continuation of the status quo, smaller government, you know, let's just not like not make too many big changes. And another president who's calling for radical changes to the system. 
right? So we can definitely debate whether those radical changes are good or bad, but the first question we should ask is if the country headed in a good direction. If the country is headed in a good direction, I'm not gonna take the risk on a radical change, I wanna vote for the status quo. However, if the country is headed in a terrible direction, even if I'm not sure that radical change will work, I still want to vote for it simply because I want the risk that it will work. This is, for example, why Donald Trump was elected to the US presidency. Not because people liked him, but because people believed that the direction of our country was bad, and they saw like the, the, his, his opponent, basically, while I think they were the better candidate, as arguing for a continuation of the status quo, no real radical changes. So while most of them probably thought Trump was going to like screw things up, at least he would try to change things, at least like maybe something would happen. Right? Like that was probably the mindset of an American voter, and it's very analogous to how your judge is operating in this round. So, what does this mean practically? This means that if you're on the AF on this topic, you want to be telling the judge at the top of your rebuttal that things are really terrible for conflict right now. Conflict in the South China Sea is escalating at an unprecedented rate. Every single day we are moving closer to war. War is basically inevitable at this point. Why is this strategic? Not only because A, this means that the Neg is doing nothing to solve this problem. At best, you're voting for them, you're still seeing a really high chance of war. But at worst, you're voting for us. Worst case scenario, we're making that chance of war 10% worse, right? But it's gonna be 10% worse by like the week from today because it's already increasing so quickly, that doesn't really mean anything. But you have a chance on the app of fully reversing that trend from increasing to decreasing. That's a chance that I would take my odds on. That's why you should vote out. Right? On the neg, your uniqueness needs to be the opposite. You need to explain that the status quo is great, utopia, and voting for the app is the only risk of jeopardizing utopia. So what you need to say on the app neg, and this is just an example, is you say, my opponent tells you that tensions are really high right now. But according to Foreign Policy Magazine, while tensions are high, China is incredibly unlikely to start a war right now because the US's naval strength has effectively deterred them from starting any conflict they know they're going to lose. This is really critical because when you vote for the app, there's a risk that this deterrence gets stronger. But we don't need to make it any stronger when it's strong enough. But there's also a risk that this deterrence gets weaker. And that's where you really see the probability that tensions turn into conflict. Which that if you don't want a conflict to happen, you vote for the side that's actively mitigating it, not the side that risks opening the floodgates to war. So even if they have some probability of increasing deterrence, like their solution doesn't mean anything because you've already solved the problem, whereas there is a risk that they're going to undo the progress we've already made, so you default to the next. That's the value of, the value of uniqueness. It's essentially weighing on the link level in terms of probability. That's what it effectively becomes. Third and final thing is a defense wall. So this is like a, a very specific type of overview where it's basically just a response that was read in rebuttal, but then it gets extended at the top of the summary speech because of its importance. This is one of those like two to five core responses I was talking about. If you have a defensive response that engages with several of their arguments, like, like almost everything in their case is basically severely mitigated by this response, it's probably a good idea to extend it at the top and explain how this takes out most of their offense more generally so you don't waste time extending it the same thing five times. So for example, like our NAFTA thing, that card saying that trade would have been the same either way, right? Ishan comes up and he says, right, like the first thing you would send is this card, we tell you that trade would have been either way. This means that virtually all of their benefits are gonna happen in either world. We tell you the only two differences is that A, it happened faster, and B, there was no government regulation. That means that this debate is about whether those regulations were a good or a bad thing, which means the focus of this round is the turns on their case and our case, because like they're not reading arguments about why regulations are bad, but we are specifically, all of our turns are why regulations are good, as well as our entire case is about why regulations would have prevented Mexico from getting screwed over. So basically, <coughs> intrinsically, like 95% of the debate after that response is extended is happening on arguments that we made. And whenever the debate shifts to arguments that you made, you're winning, basically, right? Uh, well, an overview should not be like a new contention that you're reading. It should not be new offense in the rebuttal or new uh, in, or in the summary at the top of the speech. That's not what it's for. It's fundamentally for framing the round through defense, impact framing, or uniqueness. So you should extend some of this, right? On this topic, I think you might be okay doing two of these three things. So you would first say the most important impact is conflict, and here's why. And then whatever arguments they have that are not linked to conflict, quickly explain why it's going to outweigh those arguments. So if their arguments are foreign aid and conflict, but this is the reason this outweighs foreign aid is because like even the higher, even an increase in the risk of conflict is going to immediately decrease investor confidence and decrease trade, for example, which is billions of dollars lost by developing countries in a greater way than any amount of foreign aid could be. In addition, obviously, conflict is a more direct impact on life, which is why we're going to be focusing on their second intention. That being said, we tell you in the status quo, and this is where you get to uniqueness, conflict is increasing right now, and the trend is going towards an inevitable war, which is the only risk of solving back this since the neg is doing nothing is voting out and reversing this trend. So I got my impact framing and I got my uniqueness. Now let's go to their case. So let's go to part two of the summary slash final focus, which is their case. 
The first part is at most 30 seconds. It can't be that much longer. You just need to explain it, maybe answer their responses, but usually people don't do a good job of responding to these things, and finally go to their case. On their case, you need to be very selective about the responses and arguments that you expect. First, you should only be sending turns that are weighable. This means that turns, offense, that will win you the round even if you lose other arguments. There are only two types of turns that do this. The first of which is a straight turn, basically an argument that takes whatever they say and makes says that the opposite is true. All right. So an example is saying unclose would increase our legitimacy, and the straight turn would be to say that unclose would decrease our legitimacy, and here's why. On net, it would decrease our legitimacy for the same reason they give you. So if their reason is that being an internet, following the same rules, increases our legitimacy, you would say that, that being party to the agreement decreases it because we're never going to follow the rules, but now we're expected to, which obviously is then going to prove that we can't follow rules even when we sign agreements, therefore legitimacy goes down. Right? That's a direct turn. You're proving that the warrant that they give you, the opposite is true, the impact that they give you, the opposite is true. These don't necessarily need to be weighed as heavily because if all you're trying to do is prevent them from going for that argument, you just need to extend the term, right? Because that just means that their argument is false, which means they can't go for it, they can't win on it. However, right, if you're trying to win with the turn, right, then you need to weigh the turn. And you'd be like, the reason why this is important is good. Like, and you have two options. Either A, you can link it into your own weighing analysis and explain how it gets you back to that most important impact, or B, and this is kind of snaky, but it works. You can take their weighing analysis, embrace it, and use it against them. Like The reason why this is important is because they tell you that the prerequisite to any long-term solution is having legitimacy. So if we win legitimacy, that means there is literally no way to affirm the resolution under their own framework. Right? That is how you basically take a turn and turn it into round-ending offense. Like the judge does not need to look at other arguments because you have done the weighing for them. You have basically put the burden on them to win this argument, and they have lost it. So that's one option. The second type of turn uh, is a, and the most common type of turn is not actually a turn. It's a disadvantage or advantage. So this is really when you're not denying that what your opponents are saying is true. You're just responding to it by saying that something else at the same time is happening that is worse, or something else that is happening at the same time that is better. So a great example of this is the PSI argument. The NEG says that you're going to be weakening the US's naval power because we can't interdict uh, things that were without consent or without intelligence. The app says turn the argument against them, so and so finds that we're gonna have five more countries in PSI when we seek to unclose because it gives us more credibility in international negotiations. That's not a turn, that is an advantage. Right? You can call it a turn and round, I don't particularly care, but that does not make my argument on the neg untrue that the US is getting weaker. It's just introducing a different factor that may solve the problem in a greater way. So these responses especially need to be weighed on two levels. First, they need to be weighed on the link level. You need to explain why this advantage or disadvantage is a better solution or a worse solution to the problem than whatever they provide. So in this example, you need to first explain why having more countries is more important than making one country relatively weaker. And as I just gave an example, right, you could argue that, for example, having more intelligence means that we can more easily meet the requirement that we have evidence, plus we get to hit more countries at the same time. Whereas on the neg, you could say that having one strong country that is actually capable of interdiction is better than having 10 weak countries that while capable of interdiction will be denied at the front door of a ship, right? Either of these makes it very clear that your link is stronger. Second type of way you need to have these responses is impact way. You need to explain, now that you've won this turn, again, why does this win you the round? Why is it sufficient for the judge to cast the vote on that? Because if it's insufficient, it does not matter. It literally does not help you. And the way to do this is, again, either link it back into your own framework where you say, like, this is really critical because it's just another link into our argument about conflict where we tell you that when you increase the strength of the US through multilateralism, you're gonna deter conflict around the globe, not just in China, right? Or you can bite their way and be like, this is really critical because they themselves tell you that the number one cause of conflict in the world is nuclear weapons transfers. So when we are making nuclear weapons transfers more effective, we are literally solving back for what they tell you themselves is the biggest impact in the round. You can sign your ballot even if we lose our case. Right, either of these is good, anything without that is basically wasted time. The other thing you should be extending is defense. These are responses to their case. So, there are two types of defense. The first type is terminal defense. This is basically defensive responses that make their argument entirely untrue. So for example, if they say that we have to transfer technology uh, through unclosed to other countries, right, and that's bad. Terminal defense would either be saying that, would basically be saying that no, we don't, right? That rule was, was repealed five years ago, or uh, all of our technology comes from the private sector, and that rule only applies to the public sector. 
therefore, like, this is just not true, right? Terminal defense just means your argument is false. You can just extend that and move on, right? Because that just basically prevents them from being able to go for the argument. The second type of defense is mitigatory defense. Basically, this is arguments that, like, so it shows that their argument is less true, but not that it's entirely false. So teams usually have these link chains where they're saying, like, A causes B, B causes C, C causes D, and D causes our impact, right? They're saying at every link level, they're saying something causes something which causes something. And the problem with these link chains is that they're usually very drawn out, and every piece of their link chain becomes a little more tenuous, right? So, for example, um, do you guys know the, are you guys familiar with the H1B visa topic, most of you? Yeah. Uh, for, for those of you who aren't, it was about whether the U.S. should increase H-1B visas, which is basically high-skilled immigrants that come primarily from India to work in like the U.S. IT industry. Should we take more of them or should we take less of them? In the Tournament of Champions, by the late elimination rounds, most of this, the arguments were not about the United States. They were actually about India, how India would be impacted by sending more of their skilled workers to the United States. So on the affirmative side, the team in semifinals was running an argument that basically, if we take more of these H-1B workers, they will come to America, they will get better skills, and then they will go back to India later on, and they will use those skills to grow India's economy and create better opportunities in India. On the app, they were saying that these people will leave India, which will cause a loss of skilled workers from India on net, which means that India will basically be prevented from growing their economy at a faster rate. And the reason that both teams were framing this round around India was because the biggest impacts were in India, which again goes back to the idea of picking the biggest impact and framing your case around it. Now, here's why the negative team that's running the brain drain argument is winning this round and not the affirmative team, which is running the brain gain argument. Basically, the app team's link chain is too tenuous. The app team says that first, these people are going from India are very high skilled. Second, they're going to come to America and bring their high skills to US tech companies. Third, they're going to move up the ranks in these US tech companies to get like insider information that you can't get in India right now. Fourth, they're going to willingly choose to move back from America to India. Fifth, they're going to start new businesses in India that don't already exist using new information. Seven, you, those new businesses are going to create entirely new products and services that don't exist right now. And eight, these new products and services are going to encourage manufacturing, because if we create new products, we need to build them, which will then employ poor and low-skilled people in India, which is the terminal impact of their case, reducing poverty. So many links. On the neg, all they say is, India's economy is doing well right now, they're growing, but it's mainly reliant on these skilled workers. If we have H-1B visas, these skilled workers will leave, their growth will stop, bad things happen. A lot more like, very simple, right? So in the rebuttal, Rabia, the second speaker on the neg, doesn't, and she, you guys should all go to office hours with her, by the way, if you haven't. She's also very, very good at this kind of approach. Will come up and she'll basically poke, she pokes a lot of holes in their link chain without at, at any point really terminally taking it out. She pokes like a ton of holes in her link chain, in her link chain, which like mostly reduce it. So first she says, she reads a card or like makes an analytical response that the vast majority of H1B workers who are coming from India are actually not high skilled in the com conventional sense. They actually only have low IT skills, not like high skilled IT which is necessary for the US. Second, she says that these people are, um, are not gonna move up the ranks at US companies. They're only going to like stay in low level positions so they won't learn anything new. Third, she says that even if they do, they all go generally to the same 15 to 20 large corporations bring in almost all of these H1B immigrants Therefore, they're not going to get any new information. They're getting the same information from the same companies. Fourth of all, she says that these people basically don't have an incentive to come back to India. They're just going to stay in America, which is the intelligence won't go there. And she kind of she uh, she like kind of casts doubt on their statistic, which says that they go back by saying, "Oh, that was from a different time period when condition were like when economic opportunities in India were a lot better, and when America was experiencing like a recession or something. So they had an obvious incentive to go back then. But we would argue that they don't now because the salaries here are higher. Next, she says that even if they do go back, they're not going to start small businesses. And when they do, most small businesses actually fail and have a lot of hurdles to get through so they won't be seeing their impact. And finally, she actually questions the idea that this is even good by saying that it's better for people to stay in India and work for the large companies that are driving all of the growth in India than to take a risk on these small businesses when we don't even know that these people are going to be able to start them or come back. So, so many holes that she's poking, but none of it's really offensive. None of it's really saying, oh, this is a reason to vote for us. And none of it's really saying that this argument is fully untrue. But at every point, she's saying, like, this is probably not like as big of a deal as they're talking about. Then in the summary speech, and this is again what I was about to talk about, they turn this into like the cleanest reason to vote for them. They come up and they say, right, right, 
James and Brian extend their arguments, but they really are not answering a lot of fundamental questions. They're not jumping over the hurdles that Rabia puts in a rebuttal in order for them to get from the resolution to the impact. They're not answering whether the people who are coming here actually have 21st century skills. They're not answering whether they're moving up the ranks, nor whether they're going to new companies and getting new information. They're also not answering whether they still have an incentive to go back and whether their businesses will succeed, whereas we give you a clearer picture that these businesses will not succeed. This means that at the end of the round, there is no way to know whether H-1Bs are going to cause Indian growth and whether that growth is going to be substantial. But what you know for certain is that the moment you affirm the resolution, people leave India, which is brain drain happens. Our link is guaranteed, whereas theirs has way too many hurdles for you to weigh their offense. This means that you prioritize our impacts where we tell you, and then they just go off to their impacts, right? So she's weighing at the link level simply by casting so much doubt on their argument. Therefore, this hurdles approach, while each response in isolation is not particularly strong, when you kind of bring them all together in your summary and point out how many holes that they have not addressed, you can very clearly weigh on strength of link and say that your argument is just stronger and clearer, whereas theirs is not. And this puts them in an incredible strategic position when they go back to defend their case, because their case is just so much simpler than the other side's case. So, defensive responses should be terminal defense, and they should be like this hurdle approach, right? Like, you can cast doubt on their argument if you don't have specific responses, but then you want to be going through this general idea of unweighability later in the round. Finally, once you're done covering their case, what do you do on your case? So, covering your case requires two things. The first is to drop arguments. So, this sounds counterintuitive, but like you're going to have multiple arguments in your case. Even if you read a one contention case, you're going to have multiple explanations, multiple warrants for the same thing. You shouldn't be going for all four minutes of your case. You should take the argument that is the strongest, either the easiest to weigh or the easiest to win, and go for that argument. Extend that argument later in the round. This means strategically choosing arguments that you're not going to go for in this round. Once you make that decision that you're going to go for, like, let's say, my third warrant into why we increase cooperation, you need to get out of the responses to the first and second warrant so that they don't come back to bite you in later, round, later speeches. If they only read defensive responses, you just don't need to talk about the first and second warrant. You just be like, let's go back to our third warrant where we talk about increasing cooperation through X. Right? They, like, they don't have anything to gain by just repointing out that you dropped your first and second. You've made it clear you don't really care about them anymore. But if they turn it, like if they turn one of your arguments against you and they turn it into offense for their side, right, that could be a problem for you. Because like you don't want to go for your second argument and win that, but then they go for like your first argument on the opposite side and they weigh that. Because then you're like in this weird situation where you have to weigh your contention over a turned version of your contention. That's like a really bad situation to be in. So what you do is you have to strategically quote unquote sever out of arguments. Basically, you make these arguments unturnable, the ones that you're not going for, unweighable for their side. This can happen in a few ways. One way this can happen is if they make a contradiction. So if they respond to your argument by saying first that your argument just doesn't happen or is untrue, but second, that the opposite of your argument is true. So basically, your link is not, not there, but your impact is actually the opposite. So for example, if you say that um, UNCLOS is going to increase oil drilling, right? And then oil drilling is going to be bad, right? They respond by first saying, no, UNCLOS will not increase oil drilling. According to so-and-so, the only thing that matters for oil drilling is the price of oil. Therefore, even if like UNCLOS happens, they're either going to want to drill either way or they're not going to want to drill either way. UNCLOS is not a factor. That's terminal defense, right? That's a defensive response which proves that your argument is just false. But then they read an impact turn, and they say, but let's go to their impact where they say that oil drilling will cause climate change. The problem is that according to so-and-so, the impact on climate change is very infinitesimal. It doesn't actually matter. What really matters according to so-and-so is that by getting access to this oil, we're going to have more power, and we're going to have more leverage, which is going to help us beat countries like China and Russia. Right? Yeah, what's up? What if you just like flip the order of how you like read them? Like, what if you, what if you just said, like, you, you read the impact turn, and you said, like, but even if you don't buy the impact turn, then, like, at best, there are these not I would still go for the 98. But like, there, you shouldn't- Like, like, you, like if you were frontlining it, you'd still just point out a contradiction? I wouldn't point out a contradiction. I would basically just go up and I would be like, uh, like, okay, quickly on our first contention, they read defense saying that, uh, like, that like uh, sorry. Quickly on our first contention, they read defense saying that economics is the only factor that matters. Fine, we can see that means they can't get access to their turn about like fighting back on Russia and China. Now let's go to our second contention, which really matters. Right? It doesn't matter which order they read it. So um, if you're reading a rebuttal, right, if you want to read a link defense, meaning like you want to prove that their warrant is untrue, but also read an impact turn, seeing that their impact is actually the opposite, you're, you can't expect to go for the impact turn. You can't expect to win off of the impact turn. The only reason you would want to, to do them together is like, while you don't want to, um, to 
really win off of their argument, it just still makes it harder for them to win their argument. Because in order for them to win their argument, they would have to respond to both your defense and your impact deterrent. If they can't respond to both of them, then they lose. If they respond to one of them, you just go for the other. Like if they prove the impact is still good, you go for the defense, you prove the argument still doesn't happen. If they relink their argument and prove that their argument does still happen, you can go for the impact and be like, fine, we agree, but we're still winning that this impact is gonna be good. That's the only reason you would read them together. But if you're just trying to not go for the argument and make it a non-issue for the rest of the round, concede the defense and move on. That's one option. A second option is um, just answer the turn, right? Like directly engage and respond to the turn. If they didn't read defense, if they just turned the argument, they're like, yeah, we agree Arctic drilling will go up. However, Arctic drilling is good. You probably just need to respond to it and be like, no, it's bad. And compare your reason for why it's bad to their reason for why it's good. That would be an example of responding to a turn. Right? It's not because you're trying to win that argument, per se, like you would be winning it, but it's like not the argument you're going for, you just want to make sure that they don't win off of that argument. Third, and the most strategic way to sever out of an argument is to outweigh the turn. So, if you have two contentions, right, and you're going to advance the second one, and the second one has a particular impact, you need to prove that the impact of your second argument does not only outweigh every argument from your opponent's case, it also outweighs the turn on your first contention. It literally outweighs the negative of your first contention. So, on my demo debate for this topic, on the neg, I ran two contentions, or like really two subpoints of one argument. One was about weakening the US Navy, and the second one was about making China stronger by basically like creating the perception that America was appeasing or giving into them, which would then basically embolden China to be more aggressive. Right? So my opponents tried to turn our first warrant about multilateralism uh, with multilateralism and said that like, oh no, the US Navy will not get weaker, they'll actually work with more countries, therefore the US Navy will actually get effectively stronger. Right? They tried to turn that, and then we decided to collapse on our second warrant about making China stronger. So we engaged the turn in two ways. First, obviously, we responded to it simply because we had an easy response, which was that, uh, again, going back to the whole thing about the worldview, we were able to very easily respond to it, right? They tell you that they're going to be seeing an increase in multilateralism. Yeah, as we point out, it's better to have one strong country that can impose real consequences than 10 countries that are using law but are not imposing any consequences. Multilateralism is not intrinsically good until you link it back to country self-interest. But second, even if they win that the U.S. gets stronger, we still win if we win our second argument about China. And here's the reason why. If both the U.S. and China are getting stronger at the same time, this means that the risk of conflict is still higher. For example, in the Cold War, both sides were getting stronger, yet the risk of conflict was increasing. So winning the turn to our first war does not matter if we win our second war, right? We were obviously more concise and just said like the up to the risk of conflict still gets higher, which means you still vote next so long as we win any of our second war. That's what we said. And then we go now go to our second war, which talks about strengthening China. This is how you sever out of arguments you're not going for. But again, you only need to do this if they return to the argument. Finally, going for an argument, select the argument that you think is most strategic. Most strategic, first, in terms of the impact, right? It needs to get you access to the biggest impact. And second, in terms of the biggest link. It needs to be the best link into that impact, the best logical reason for why one side or the other should get that impact. Now, when you're actually going for an argument, there are four steps you need in the back half to win this argument and therefore win the round. The first of which is explain the argument. Be like, go to our second intention, immediately spend one to two sentences just explaining the argument logically in your own words. Nothing more, nothing less. No mention of the responses, no citing the specific cards, just tell the story of why it's true. Like, we tell you that when the US exceeds to unclose, you legitimize China's narrative that we're being hypocritical. You essentially tell the rest of the world that they can be aggressive, falsely blame the United States, and get away with it, which incites even more aggression all around the globe. That's our argument, right? So, we just explain it. The reason you explain it is first to just simply remind the judge of what you're saying, but also to show how logical and how clear your story. Create logical appeal to your story, because now you're about to tack off on their responses, and when you're dealing with their responses, if your story has logical appeal, they're more likely to buy your counter responses, simply because they want your logically appealing story to be true. They want to resolve the cognitive dissonance, the clash of ideas that's happening in their head, and the clearest way to do so is a good logical explanation. Now, second part is frontline. This just means respond to their responses one by one. Uh, sometimes you will not have time to deal with all of their responses, which requires strategic frontlining. Either this can happen either by picking the responses that are actually terminal, right? Like don't respond to like basic mitigation. Like if they say that, oh, this is like your impact is not as big as you say it is, as long as that's still enough for you to win, you should just be like, fine, that's just mitigatory. We still get access to some of the hundreds of billions of dollars, which means we're still impacting directly to poverty, which we point explain is the biggest impact in the round. That's okay, right? But generally, you want to respond to them. Now, in order to save time in responding, this can be effectively done through, again, having a worldview and having a narrative, right? So a lot of their responses will just 
not engage your narrative or your worldview. Most responses, especially turns, do not invalidate your argument. They are, like I said, disads or advantages. So, like I say that we like uh, that. Uh, what is it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like on the NAFTA topic, we talked about how NAFTA destroyed all the domestic businesses, like the domestic industries in Mexico. And then we hit this team, which was just ra like tacking off like eight responses, and all of them were about how multinational corporations, not domestic ones, were creating jobs in other sectors, like the auto industry and like the food industry. They were just giving like, oh, it happened here, it happened here, it happened here, and they just spent like just, like a minute and a half just tacking off card and click card, every single one a blippy response, right? We're not going to go through and answer each one of those logically. We're going to use our narrative. So we say like. Like, we're not going to respond to their eight individual arguments about how multinational corporations created a job. We agree that multinational corporations created a job. Our argument is that domestic industries were destroyed. The reason you prefer our argument over their turns is first because we read you specific evidence telling you that domestic industries pay workers better, employ more people, and lower prices more because they have more of an incentive to help the domestic economy. But second, we tell you that on net there was a job loss and an increase in unemployment, meaning all of their benefits are outweighed by the loss of domestic industry. So this is again grouping responses and strategically engaging them with your narrative and your warrant. So like that's what we did in like a round of nationals against a team that was debating much quicker and with much more evidence than we were. But like we just grouped a lot of their responses because they just did not engage our narrative and it was enough for us to very clearly win by the end of the round. So second step is frontline. Again, some responses require direct confrontation. Other responses require a link way, right? If you run PSI on the neg and they read the turn about how it's gonna increase more countries, just be prepared to explain why one strong country is better than three weak countries, right? Be prepared to give that explanation. That explanation is sufficient to respond to or outweigh the response. Frontline. Third part is just extend the argument. This is mostly just to appease your flow judge colleagues. So just be like, once you're done, like, and, like, and finally they tell you this, they're, like, that this X response, but we tell you this Y counter response. At that point, this gives us the link from, and then you should say the last name, ideally in a debate, you should cite the last name as a reminder for flow judges who are actually flowing the citations of your sources. Right? This gives us the, in, the link from the Rosé card, which tells you that when we exceed to unclose, our unilateral military interdictions are going to be destroyed because we have to either have the support of the party or we have to have intelligence that we simply don't have. That's your link card, right? That gives us access to the impact card from so-and-so, which tells you that this program is stopping dozens of nuclear missiles from transporting every single year, and that nuclear missiles is a prerequisite to countries starting conflicts because they need to feel that they are secure before they start a war. So I'm just ex extending the link in the impact card now just to make it clear that now that we've answered the responses, now that we've explained our argument, this is actually the offense that we're getting from a technical standpoint. Fourth and final part of, of your offense. Once you've won the argument, you've won the link, you've won the impact, what do you do? You need to weigh the argument specifically, you need to implicate the argument for the round. Implicate means do not explain the argument in terms of other arguments, explain the argument in terms of the judge's ballot. Why does the judge write their ballot on the basis of the argument you chose to go for? This means you need to take, you need to basically think about what the other team is thinking. Why does the other team think they won in an ideal world? If I was a judge and I had to write an RFD for the other side right now, I was forced to vote for them and just think of the easiest way for me to vote for them in a close round, what would I say? You need to take your impact and basically smash that button, that smash that RFD. You need to say, this impact means that you can no longer make that decision in good faith. Right? And here's how you do so. So like if they're going for an argument about like reducing China's aggression and you're going for an argument about increasing nuclear weapons, you need to first explain, for example, maybe like there are many ways you can do this. Either you can weigh on the link level, right? So you can say that um, that conflict is like a bigger cause of conflict is nuclear weapons, right? And you can explain why, because it's a prerequisite to other countries. You can also weigh directly on the impact level by saying that there are more there are we are stopping more conflicts than they are. Because while they are focusing on one conflict in China, we are telling you that if we don't stop these weapons from moving abroad, there are going to be dozens of new countries that have these weapons that start conflicts that we can prevent proactively by voting for the negative. Right? So you're like so you're weighing on the impact level, but you're also weighing on the link level that you can see like we are weighing on the link level because so and so finds that we are unlikely to go to war with a country like China because both of us are incredibly powerful, both of us have nuclear weapons, that's never going to happen. We know we're both going to be losing in that situation. A more likely scenario of conflict is when one country has a nuclear weapon and one country doesn't. This is really important because we can't have nuclear weapons going to developing countries because then they're going to start bullying their neighbors who don't have those nuclear weapons. That's where war really happens. 
happens, which is A, we have a stronger leg, but second, we outweigh in strength of impact because we tell you again that we are preventing dozens of countries from getting weapons, which we are preventing dozens of conflicts from materializing, whereas they're just preventing one conflict, which frankly is not going to happen. Right? So on the link and impact level, you are taking their offense, taking the best case scenario for them, and just absolutely destroying it in those last 20 seconds of your final focus. Now as a judge, I can no longer cast a ballot for the China argument in good faith with you explicitly telling me why I cannot cast a ballot for the China argument in good faith. So, to summarize. First, narrative debate. Adopt a worldview. Think of a position. Think beyond the resolution. What is the logical explanation? What is the logical basis for the arguments you make, not just in the scope of the resolution? Use your worldview to reinterpret your opponent's arguments with different causes and different solutions. Second, responses and not uh, carded responses and advice applications are insufficient. Use logic to compare your responses and use link and impact level way to compare why a disadvantage or advantage, which we call turns in public forum debate, is better than their initial source of offense. And third, be effective in terms of your case writing, rebuttal, and final focus. From your case perspective, it means think about first the biggest impact, then the best link, write your cases around that, right? From the rebuttal, it means read key responses that can be linked up to most arguments, use overviews like uniqueness, frame, uh, uniqueness, most important impact, and defensive, uh, defensive walls, essentially to frame the debate on your side, and finally, extend, make key turns that are actually weighable. And finally, in your summary and final focus, begin by framing the round. Second, begin by making key extensions of turns that are actually weighable to the ballot, defense that either entirely takes out their argument or casts way too much doubt on their argument for them to have a chance of winning it. And finally, go to your case, sever out of the arguments that you're not going for by pointing out their contradictions or by simply pointing out that these arguments do not outweigh the one you're going for. Go for an argument, explain the argument, frontline the argument, extend the impact, and finally, explain why winning that argument is enough for you to win, even if they won a turn on every other argument on your case, and they won every single impact in the debate. Like, even if they won every argument in their case, and every other argument in your case, your impact should still be enough for you to win. That is the ideal goal of a summary and final focus, and if you spent two minutes collapsing on and going for just one argument in your case, that would have still won you the round, which requires incredibly good implication and weighing. It requires you to be very specific and go into the nitty gritty, link your impact up to every single thing that they try to go for in the back half of the debate. That's how you're going to consistently win rounds because you're making it very clear for a judge where they should sign their ballot. All right, that's the narrative debate for you guys. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments, any feedback? What time is it? All right, it's like seven minutes to 11. Uh, does anybody want to work on anything else? Like a couple questions about the topic, specific arguments, things you heard in your lectures? I think they're like that. I had a quick yeah, that's So like how do you figure out what the like two worldviews are for each side? Yeah. 